guys, so I'm gonna take this uh, propagation of this Hoya Callistophylla that I got from my friends over at Flora Collaborative, and they are a greenhouse based here in the Finger Lakes, and they grow primarily carnivorous plants, so things like Nepenthes and Saracenia and stuff like that, but they also have some tropical plants as well, like some Hoyas and some Aroids, but they really specialize in carnivorous plants. So when I was there, they offered me this Hoya Callistophylla, which I graciously took. I'm trying not to collect too many plants in this kind of transition period between Brooklyn and the Finger Lakes. However, it's hard to say no when somebody offers you something, and it's also not something that has to travel too far. So they actually grow theirs in coconut coir, which I'm gonna show you here. If I could hide my eyes and it can just focus on that. But look at that Callistophylla. That's really beautiful with the dark venation. But then if you look behind the leaves, if you could look past the leaves and into the substrate, that right there is coconut coir. And I would just recommend that if you are continuing to, to grow in coconut coir, there's nothing wrong with that at all. However, you have to make sure that it, it doesn't have any um, salts in it. And because you don't know whether the coconuts were growing by the seaside and the coconut coir quality could vary rapidly or widely depending on you know, where that coconuts, uh, where those coconuts were grown. So, uh, Flora Collaborative, I chatted with them and they do like this triple wash just to make sure. And then they check to make sure that the dissolved um, ions are down in the coconut coir substrate. So if you're bringing in coconut coir and you're using that, just make sure that you wash it and you thoroughly get the salts off of it if it has any salts. It's kind of like when you go to the supermarket and they have those mixed greens and they're like triple washed, ready to eat. You basically have to do that with your uh, coconut coir, but don't eat the coconut coir. But you can see that they use this kind of mix and that's a really, really nice mix. It's kind of like this barky kind of uh, perlite maybe even some charcoal in there. So I'll probably continue, continue to use that. And then I'll also, if I need any more to fill this in because the root structure is not, you can see that the root structure here is not totally um, you know, super well developed. I could have probably put this in on a heating pad and that would have helped because uh, sometimes roots need heat. I've had this in my eastern facing window, but you know, this has moved from a greenhouse situation on a mist bench, basically, over to, you know, a home situation, not on a mist bench, not without, not with heat. But this coconut coir looks very much like this epiphytic mix. This is a, one of my favorite mix for epiphytes. I'm going to show this to you here. And then this is essentially like fir bark and very similar charcoal and perlite and things along those lines. So I'm gonna add some of that into here as well and just do a nice mix. because I do like the substrate that they had, but this is very similar to that. And I'm just gonna finally move this over into its own planter pot. And I'm just gonna use a regular terracotta pot. Now, one of the tricks that I like to use if you don't want the water to get sucked out of uh, when you water the plant right away is that you could soak your terracotta pot. Now, why would you do that? Well, terracotta is porous and it has a tendency to pull the water away. So uh, when you soak this in water for quite some time, even like 30 minutes, I would say, it fills up all those pores of the terracotta. So if you want something that you wanna build that moisture quite readily, um, you might wanna soak your terracotta. It's a little extra step. Sometimes people don't have that time to do that. So, you know, I would recommend, um, I would recommend only doing that if you have a lot of time. And then I have, of course, a planter base here. Now, um, I wish I could show you the other one, but it's become Tutu's water dish, my little diamond dove, my little self-saved diamond dove bird that's flying around here. So this is a terracotta base. She has a glaze on the inside of her water dish, which is a terracotta base. So I was gonna suggest having that if you have this on wood, um, try to get the terracotta that's glazed on the inside. It's regular terracotta on the outside, but that prevents the water from seeping down and leaving one of those unsightly 
watermarks on your wooden tables or shelves or desktops or anything along those lines. In this case, it's gonna be on a granite top, so I'm not worried about like the water coming through. The other thing I would say is that you have these holes and sometimes with the barky mix, I'm not so worried about the substrate falling through, but if you're using something that's a little finer, then you could use one of these guys down on the base of the hole like that. So you could see it's basically doesn't allow the substrate to pass through. I had, I had to laugh because I bought one of these terracotta pots and this one has a really generous hole on the bottom. Look at that compared to like typical, but you know, it's often good that they have the wide holes because sometimes you want the water to drain really well. And especially if it's a plant, like say you have some type of uh, cacti or succulent that likes to be drenched, but then the water pulls away quite readily, then I would recommend doing something like this. And you would probably need one of these little substrate guards right there on the bottom. So those are like little easy hacks that sometimes make a load of difference and you know keep your place a little cleaner, especially if you're working in you know small environment and you have multiple people living with you. You don't wanna be that person who's like that messy person who uh, <laughs> makes a mess. As long as you, like I say, as long as you clean up after yourself, then everything's okay. So, yeah, I mean, I might have to cut this guard a little bit because this is a smaller pot. Actually, I have some snips I'll use. I don't usually like to use these snips on plastic, but I'll use that anyway. Okay, so I just basically created like this, a little smaller. So I could put that back here and like that. And like I said, these roots are not super well developed, but they're developed enough. You don't really need much with Hoyas. I mean, if any of you have ever propagated Hoyas, I mean, a little node itself and a little leaf is, uh, is more than enough. And this one is a woodier stem, if you could see, but if you have a Hoya that has a green stem, well, there's chlorophyll in that stem. And if the, you are missing a leaf and you only have that stem, oftentimes the plant will come right back. Um, will bounce back. But when you have a woodier stem and you lose your leaves, you basically lose the, the chlorophyll in that plant and their ability to be able to photosynthesize and, and create food. So you're pretty much then a little, a little out of luck. Um, it's gonna be harder for that plant to, to, to grow into root. So I'm gonna give this more substantial substrate on the bottom because again, this root structure is not totally well developed. And one of those things that you could do, as I mentioned, is, is actually you know, giving it some bottom heat. That really helps. You know, misting it, of course. I mean, it's really hard in a home to create that environment like on a mist bench, unless you create a little micro environment. And with all the home tours that we've done here on this channel, I've been really impressed with folks who have created those little environments. A lot of folks are using their IKEA shelves in ways where they could keep up the hum humidity. It's, it's interesting to see how different people have tackled that in lieu of not having like say a greenhouse with a mist bench or anything along those lines. Oh yeah, this is, this is nice. It's packed in there right, quite nicely. Hoyas are just really marvelous house plants. They, as soon as they start to spiral and tendril all over the place though. They, they, could, they could be a challenging. I'll show you some of my Hoyas that I brought here. They've done really well. I mean, this one, my Hoya Hindu rope has been outside for most of the, most of the time. Now that it's fall, it's kind of fall weather and I've had to bring it in. I sure hope this doesn't get any kind of mealybugs or anything like that. But you can see a lot of the growth tips are growing up. It's because there's a skylight back there. And I have to say, yay to the skylight, because skylights are just really marvelous. And then I have uh, a Hoya pubicalix right here, which again, it probably shows that tendrils, all those tendrils kind of coming out all over the place. So you kind of walk by it and it smacks you in the face. And then here's a Hoya bella. Actually, I think it's actually, actually putting out a lot of new growth even though it's the, the fall. So you could see some, some growing tips right here and a growing tip right here, or somewhere around here. Yeah, a lot of new growth. Oh, here, here's another growing tip. 
And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty psyched about that. Yeah, got some, got some good stuff. Got some good stuff here, but, and they get to go outside. So yeah, this looks pretty good. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I actually, I might, because the roots are still developing here, I might actually give this um, some distilled water with a really, really light fertilizer. And uh, I, I don't think it's reacted, you know, abnormally to the water here, but sometimes I wonder if the water has a little more high minerals or salts that could affect, especially ones that are just still developing their roots. But that's essentially it. Needed to get into a pot, into a new planter, and uh, that's the way that's the way it rolls over here. Just uh, nice, light, and easy. And uh, hopefully you learned a little bit more about taking a plant from the mist bench over into a regular planter pot. All right, guys, see you later. If you're looking to up your plant game, then check out our suite of courses and offerings, including houseplant basics, troubleshoot your houseplants, the 125 houseplant care spreadsheet, and the houseplant masterclass. The courses provide you a certificate of completion when you're finished and a wealth of information that you could use to impress both your plants and your friends. More information can be found over at homesteadbrooklyn.com. And if you're seeking more information about gardening outdoors and homesteading in the country, then check out our new channel over at Flock Finger Lakes. See you there. Cheers. <laughs>